Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Because you make me feel like I've been locked out of hell. A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. Hello, hello, and welcome, Rebel Hearts. This is Christy Reeves, your host. And I'm so excited because we are going to continue our vegan series. If you've listened to recent shows, you know how passionate I am about plant-based living. And you might have heard about my own journey of how I went from eating meat to first becoming vegetarian and then to deciding I am actually going to go all in and go vegan. And it's really, really interesting because I read something on social media the other day, and I'm paraphrasing over here because I cannot remember the exact quote, but it made so much sense to me. And it said, going plant-based is not just a diet, it is actually an awakening. Wow. Amazing, right? Because for me, it's it's not just about the diet and, and eating certain foods. It's, it's, it's a whole thing that encompasses is why veganism is so important, why we need to eat plant-based. And we talked about it from the, from the point of view of eating healthy for your body. We talked about it, how plant-based diets can actually support our physical health. We also talked about animal advocacy. And today we're going to talk about the environment and why a plant-based diet is so, so much better. So let me introduce you to today's guest. Nils Sakarias is the co-founder of One Green Planet, the largest digital media platform focused on food and sustainability. Sustainability. He is also the co-host of the popular weekly podcast, Hashtag Eat for the Planet with Nils Sicarius, and co-author of the book, Eat for the Planet. Nils started his career as a media and technology lawyer, and he worked for over a decade in the digital media and online advertising space in various business and operational roles prior to founding One Green Planet. He can be found on Twitter at Nilzak, N-I-L-Z-A-C-A. Rebel Hearts, help me to welcome Nils Sicarius. <laughs> hello, hello. Hi. It's so good to have you on, Nils. Hi, Sid. Thanks for having me on. I love the applause. What a way to start a show. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Just for you. <laughs> I know. That's amazing. I am so excited to talk to another plant-based foodie over here and someone who's creating such amazing change because as you know, Rebel Hearts is all about empowering people to become the change they want to see in the world. And for me, what you're doing, no matter if it's with your website or with your podcast or with your book, you're such a rebel. You're such a change maker and you're inviting us to become the rebels as well. So thank you, first of all, for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. That's a great compliment coming from you. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Nil. Now, as you know, we start every single show with a hero's journey. And you were a lawyer and then you worked in media and advertising. So what does someone make, make someone go, oh, I'm just going to create a website and call it One Green Planet and talk about oh. conscious eating? <laughs> Yeah, I was an unconscious eater for most of my life. Uh, through most of my career, I was eating literally anything that was in front of me. If it was meat, it was better. If it was more meat, it was even better. Uh, mm -hmm. Throw some cheese and make it even, even more better. So <laughs> that was me for many, many, many years. And mm -hmm. I had a pretty smooth sailing career. I was uh, moving from one job to the next, climbing up the corporate ladder, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, life was going along pretty well until I learned about how the food I was eating made its way to my plate, which is, you know, once I learned one bit of information, it led me to the next. Mm. And I started to lose my appetite for most of the things that I loved eating. So for me, it happened because of a vacation that I took back in 2010 to mm -hmm. South America, to Argentina mm. and Brazil. Okay. And, um, you know, I've heard a lot about the grass-fed beef that was uh, available in Argentina and Brazil. So I... You were so excited about grass-fed beef because it's so much better. <laughs> Apparently, that's what I was told, right? So I uh, got there and was eating it literally three times a day. Um, mm. And then while I was on that vacation, while I was out hiking, talking to people, talking to some of the locals, they told me a little bit 
more about uh, the production of grass-fed beef, which Yay. I didn't know much about. So more specifically what was happening in the Amazon rainforest uh, with the fact that we were cutting down trees to make room mm. for cattle to graze or to grow soy to feed uh, cows. And, you know, I thought I was pretty informed and intelligent and I had this mm -hmm. fairly successful career, but I had no idea that cows ate soy or corn for that matter. Yeah, yeah. So I came back from that vacation to cut a long story short. Six months later, I was all plant based. Um, nice. And that kind of started my journey um, mm -hmm. to eventually starting One Green Planet and doing mm -hmm. all the things I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Now, since you went within six months, since you went plant based in such a short period of time, I want to put a little bit of information out there for our listeners. How did you go from eating all these cheeses and all these meats to just eating vegetables, to just eating plants? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the way I did it works for everyone. But firstly, mm -hmm. I'm, I need to be convinced by the science. So the first thing mm -hmm. I did when I came back was I uh, did a lot of inter internet research, but I also mm -hmm. bought every book I could find about the issue. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I started reading about the environment. That eventually led me to reading about uh, the health implications of okay. eating meat and dairy. And then lastly, I learned about the the barbaric, insane factory farming system, mm -hmm. which I think, yeah. you know, if you're a normal human being with a, a heart, it's yeah. very tough to learn about some of those things mm -hmm. and then unlearn them. So yeah. for me, after I knew what I knew, it became really tough for me to justify my food choices. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I try to make some excuses in the beginning. I used to still eat seafood, mm -hmm. uh, maybe in month four or five. Um, and I was still eating some dairy by month six of that journey towards plant-based. But for me, once that switch went off in my mind, um, I decided I was going to do it. So I mm -hmm. literally decided one evening, the next morning I woke up and I said, I'm going to do this vegan thing. And, um, <laughs> awesome. and did I know what I was doing? Not really, because I actually mm -hmm. was traveling for a, a business trip the next day. And I got to the airport and uh, asked the, the, there was a restaurant there and asked them if they had something vegan. And they said, yeah, French fries. Uh, and, I, and I realized, <laughs> yeah, that, no meat and fried rice. <laughs> and I realized this was going to be a lot more trickier than yeah. I than I thought mm. it was going to be. But mm. it, you know, I learned a lot over the next few months and a year or two. And in fact, it opened my taste buds and my mind to a lot of different food that I was otherwise mm. ignoring. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, the thing when you eat meat and dairy, and you're kind of used to what you love. Which in my case, I love mm -hmm. burgers and I loved. Uh, fried chicken. I loved all the worst things. Yeah. Um, you stop trying new things because you think you figured mm -hmm. out what your yeah, go-to okay. foods were. But when I eliminated mm -hmm. those, it suddenly opened up a whole new world for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did think though there weren't enough resources out there for people who are looking to learn about how to do this, mm -hmm. uh, as well as learn about the facts that led me to make this decision yeah. myself, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, in some ways explains why I decided to use my background in skills, which is in media, Mm -hmm. and um and advertising and business to use that to create a platform that w i could use to convince other people mm -hmm. like me or former mm -hmm. me's who were meat eaters who are sort of anti-vegan in some way yeah. to change the way they think about these issues mm -hmm. and then eventually change the, what they put on their plates absolutely and you said something so important because i went vegetarian 23 years ago because oh. I had salmonella poisoning twice in a row. And the first time I ended up in the hospital, I'm like, it's a sign from the universe. I have to stop eating meat. And my mom had been a vegetarian for a few years. And she did the whole went going to cooking school and learning how to make vegetarian dishes that had all the nutrients. That So we were eating really, really healthy foods. And I thought I was doing some really amazing thing by just eliminating meat and poultry and fish from my diet. And it was many, many years later, kind of what you said, what you discovered in the in in the rainforest or about rainforest, how it's not just, you know, the meat that we're eating that is affecting the animals as well as the environment. It's also the dairy. Mm -hmm. And that was the part that made me go, no, I'm going plant. There's no more dairy, no more cheeses. And there's really actually good alternative plant-based cheeses that we can make ourselves that are available in the store. So awesome. Yeah, I know it's yeah. so easy now. I mean, I think it's getting easier by mm -hmm. as days go by. But yeah. even back in uh, 2010, when I first decided to start yeah. eating this way, things were not this no. easy. And you look at it now, uh, and we can, of course, get into all of mm -hmm. that. But we're, we're in the mm -hmm. midst of, I think, a whole food revolution that's happening right now. 
yeah. with plant-based foods. And I think uh, it's just the beginning of a long, exciting journey ahead mm -hmm. for not yeah. just people like us who've been eating this way, but for anyone who wants to cut down on their meat and dairy consumption mm -hmm. or wants to try something mm -hmm. cleaner, healthier. Yeah. Yeah. You have options now. And in the past, your idea of good food was so mm -hmm. limiting and now mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel like there's even a revolution going on on a, on a much bigger scale. I saw something the other day on social media, and there's companies now that only offer vegetarian foods, at least vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And there was one company that's actually not allowing their employees to write yeah. off their meals if they're eating meat. They're only yeah. allowed to eat the white right of the plant based foods. I'm like, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, that's WeWork. That's yeah. amazing. It was great yeah. big news recently. And I think that's mm -hmm. just a sign that mm -hmm. uh, maybe what was even unthinkable, let's mm -hmm. say even five years ago, which was not yeah. so long ago, mm -hmm. is now becoming slowly the norm. It's going to still take a lot of hard work. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, we may sit in our uh, plant based bubble sometimes and think <laughs> that everyone's changing, but you've got mm -hmm. to sometimes take a step back outside yeah. cities like New York and, and mm -hmm. San Francisco mm -hmm. and Boulder and other places, look at the rest of the country and then zoom even further out and then look at the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty scary picture, actually, when you yes. when you see what's happening, mm -hmm. especially in countries like China and India. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't all uh, yeah. it is the opposite that's happening over there. People mm -hmm. are just discovering red meat and, and eating way more than they used mm -hmm. to eat. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm still on the same mission I was uh, mm -hmm. back ten, eight years ago when I started to eat plant-based was since my driver for eating this way was the environment. That's mm -hmm. always been um, my core mission. Of course, mm -hmm. I get the health argument and I totally believe in it and I, and I stand by all that science mm -hmm. as well. And of course, as I said, if you learn anything about how animals are treated in factory yeah. farms, which is where we get 95 to 99% of meat yeah. in the US at, at least, mm -hmm. you can help but then question um, what your, you know, how you view food. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So I, I, think, I think it's important to keep spreading the message so that mm -hmm. new people discover it and uh, they may get pulled in by whatever argument that resonates with them. And I'm a big believer mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about some of the facts about what is going on because you just wrote an amazing book. <laughs> Thank you. Tell us a little bit more about how your book came about and yeah, just share a little bit about your book. Yeah, so the book, uh, in some mm -hmm. ways, I've been sort of had this book in me since the beginning of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I started One Green Planet back in 2013. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems like an, a, a lifetime ago now. <laughs> uh, but I, my first thing I researched was, as I said, the environmental connection mm -hmm. to large scale animal agriculture or factory farming. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I just got too busy running One Green Planet and the work that we were doing, and we kept mm -hmm. growing and expanding. I didn't have much time to think about mm -hmm. that, the book idea, and really, I didn't think it was worth the time and effort at that point. Yeah. Uh, I coincidentally ended up meeting Gene Stone, who's the co-author on that book. He's mm -hmm. also co-authored other famous plant-based books like How Not mm -hmm. to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and he's co-authored a book with Gene Bauer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, you know, he's, he'd written books about uh, the health argument for why people should choose plant-based mm -hmm. as well as the animal rights and welfare argument but felt like there wasn't one book out there that really did justice to the environmental yeah. argument for why yeah. people need to also consider this and mm -hmm. i said well that's interesting because i've been thinking about writing a book <laughs> and i kind of have a book's worth of material um accumulated over the last mm -hmm. several years why don't we work on this book together and that's mm -hmm. kind of how it started mm -hmm. and you know, the goal with this book was pretty simple, was to create a book for the social media age, to create mm -hmm. a book for younger people who mm -hmm. not ne don't necessarily like reading books. Yeah. Because when you think about the environmental issue to most people, it seems it seems so dry and boring mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, health you can connect to because it affects you. Yeah. The animals you can connect to because you probably love animals. Most mm -hmm. people like animals. Mm -hmm. uh, but the environment you look outside your window and the sun seems to be shining most days mm -hmm. and things seem to be okay. So what are we, what are we complaining about? And I think the environmental issue is, is not been given the right kind of coverage that it deserves mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. hasn't been put forth in the right manner. It's mostly yeah. these very dense yeah. and dry yeah. books that are 500 pages long that <laughs> maybe You're I will scientific. read. Yeah. yeah, maybe I will mm -hmm. care to read, but not many people mm -hmm. will. And yeah. so we wanted a book that could reach younger people that would be mm -hmm. small, packed with infographics, mm -hmm. with facts that will be less than 200 pages, 
that mm-hmm. would communicate every important issue mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. how factory farming impacts the environment so that mm-hmm. it could be useful for someone, even if they already eat this way, but most importantly, useful for someone who doesn't understand mm-hmm. the environmental connection. Yeah. So yeah. I really think of the environmental connection as a common sense uh, mm-hmm. argument, less of an mm-hmm. um, argument about loving uh, the oceans and hugging <laughs> trees. Not mm-hmm. that there's anything wrong with either of those things, but some people just don't, they live in cities, they don't experience nature, and we are generally so disconnected from the natural Absolutely, world yeah. that to think about saving the environment when we're too busy trying to just get by on a daily basis mm-hmm. and figure out how to feed ourselves and our family, It's Mm -hmm. a lot to ask more people. So I get Mm -hmm. that. So I think of the environmental argument less about saving others. It's about saving us. And the reason for that is is simple. We're at a point in uh, on our planet where we are Mm -hmm. 7.5 billion people Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and we're going to be about 10 billion by the year 2050. Mm -hmm. If we continue relying on our factory farming system to feed us cheap meat, dairy and eggs, Mm -hmm. and we keep overfishing our oceans to the mm-hmm. point where we have no wild seafood left, we're going to be a point, in a point in 2050 when most people won't have access to food. We will have mm-hmm. food sh- shortages. We will have drought. We'll have floods. We'll have uh, climate change would have destroyed most of uh, the coastal cities. And we will also have no land to grow food on because everyone's going to want meat and there is no more land yeah, left to yeah. create meat. You know, some of the stats, and I won't go into all the stats, the book has the details mm-hmm. on it, but if we want to feed people on a meat heavy mm-hmm. diet, we're going to have to produce more food in the next 40 years that has been produced in the last 10,000 years combined. Wow. That's, that's just wow. think about that for a moment. And we're going to need 50% more land. And you wow. know, I hate to break it to everyone, but we don't have that land. So unless, <laughs> unless Elon Musk is really getting mm-hmm. us to Mars and beyond, mm-hmm. I think the focus is really how do we protect our planet mm-hmm. to the point where we can stop extracting natural mm-hmm. resources mm-hmm. much faster than those resources are capable of re- replenishing themselves. So it's Absolutely. a simple, you know, if you have kids or if you have grandkids or if you plan to have kids or you like to think about the future of humanity, mm-hmm. this is about us. This is yeah. about leaving, a, you know, yes, it's about clean rivers and, and, and a mm-hmm. beautiful thriving ocean mm-hmm. and uh, keeping our cities and our people safe, but most importantly, it is about the fact that we may be like, the mm-hmm. last generation that can mm-hmm. actually do something to yeah. slow down the pace of yeah. climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if I had to tell you, the only thing you have to do, forget, you can recycle, you can turn off the faucet, you can drive mm-hmm. an electric car, you can do all that. But the mm-hmm. most impactful thing is what you put on your plate three yeah. or more times a day. Yeah. And just start small, mm-hmm. do whatever you can, mm-hmm. and you can be a change maker, mm-hmm. you can be a rebel. So. Yeah. Love that. Why not? <laughs> Love that. I have this quote for you. The real battle for the future of the planet and the future of the human race is being fought on your plates multiple times a day with every food choice you make. And I love, love, love that quote. This is just like, because here's the thing, what you're saying is like, I think so many people don't think about it. They think, oh, if I take care of the environment or, you know, plant trees or do more gardening, I'm contributing. Yes, you are. But I think the big, they don't realize that the biggest impact on our planet is the the animal agriculture. Mm -hmm. It's, Yeah. It is the biggest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, more Mm -hmm. than all of transportation. So already it's number one when it comes to greenhouse Mm -hmm. gases. And Mm -hmm. perhaps you find that concept, most people may find that concept Mm -hmm. confusing and climate change seems very scientific and and boring. Stop. Don't think about that. Let's think about what's happening when you cut down the rainforest, right? Mm -hmm. I started talking about the rainforest. Most people don't realize when you cut down a tree in a rainforest, you're destroying much more than just one tree or many, a few mm-hmm, trees. Mm-hmm. You're basically cutting down some the, the forest that is a defense against climate change yeah, because the trees yeah. absorb the carbon. When you cut them mm-hmm. down, you're releasing more carbon into the atmosphere. Exactly, you're also yeah. cutting down the habitat for millions of species that rely mm-hmm. on the rainforest. Mm-hmm. You're also impacting the local communities that rely on plants and medicines that come out of mm-hmm. that rainforest for their mm-hmm. livelihood. Mm-hmm. And to make things worse, you're replacing it with cattle grazing and yeah. soy production, which is only adding more greenhouse gases to the environment, mm-hmm. destroying the soil, and then all the dirt from the soil starts leaching into our rivers and our waterways. And mm-hmm. can you just imagine, the factory farms in the U.S. alone produce 
369 million tons of poop. <laughs> no. 369 million? million tons of, of poop. Oh so that's enough to fill the Empire State Building every day of the wow. year for an entire wow. year. So where wow. does all this, where does all that dirt go, right? It goes mm -hmm. typically in these out open air lagoons. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of it's converted into fertilizer. Most of it is just sprayed in the neighbor, the, the farms are surrounding the factory farms. And eventually what ends up happening, it, it ends up in our rivers and eventually mm -hmm. in our oceans. I mean, it ends mm -hmm. up in our oceans, just, just keep this in mind. We're talking yeah. about the, the grossest water yeah. on earth. Yeah. It's high yeah. in ni nitri um, nitrogen and phosphorus. It leads mm -hmm. to a phenomena called um, algae blooms, where you essentially, you suck up all the oxygen in the water. So all the fish that live in those rivers and those lakes suddenly have no oxygen to breathe. Wow. And this leads to something called a dead zone. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is there's a trickle down effect that we don't mm -hmm. necessarily see when mm -hmm. we see a piece of meat on our plates. And yeah. my goal with the book to answer your original question was <laughs> uh, really to help people make these bigger connections that what is what are the oceans have to do with it? What, do, what does yeah. clean air have to do with this? Mm -hmm. What does mm -hmm. fresh water have to do mm -hmm. with this? It isn't just about one thing. It's about this um, perfect storm that we're creating mm -hmm. where we're overfishing our oceans. Yeah. We are destroying it because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And then we're also dumping plastic into our ocean, which yes. is a completely separate yes. topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're fishing the fish out and the fish have eaten plastic. And then now the humans are eating plastic because they're eating the fish. Yeah, so it's this yeah. entire cycle of, of insanity mm -hmm. that we've created. And it all comes back to like you said with a quote, it comes back to the choices we make when we mm -hmm. sit down to eat. And mm -hmm. with one simple choice, you have a, you have a chance to either um, be a part of that destructive mm -hmm. insanity or to be part mm -hmm. of the solution. So it's awesome. as simple as that. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, Neil. That's amazing. I want to continue a little bit on the whole water topic. You already talked about mm -hmm. the pollution of the water. Let's talk about the water usage yeah. in plant-based animal products. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the highest level, if you eat plant-based for one day, you save mm -hmm. 1,500 gallons of water. Wow. Now, that may seem like a lot or maybe not, but let's mm -hmm. give you some context, right? Mm -hmm. You look at planet Earth, it's about 71% water. Most mm -hmm. of it is the ocean. It's seawater. Yeah. It's salt yeah. water. Uh, there's only 2.5% fresh water on planet Earth, and only 1% mm -hmm. of that can be accessed by us because most of it is trapped in the glaciers and snow fields. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're doing is we're giving 23% of that water to livestock, while about 700 million people around the world lack mm -hmm. access to clean, fresh yeah, water. Yeah. Uh, and that's only because over the years, we've discovered as our population started to grow, we've discovered that the only way to produce cheap meat that people love mm -hmm. is to feed the cows corn and soy because it helps yeah. them helps fatten up the cows really quickly. Mm -hmm. So it makes mm -hmm. the system very efficient. Mm -hmm. Both soy and corn are very water intensive crops. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, beef cattle alone, just a cow will consume about 100,000 gallons of water just yeah. because oh. the water it takes to grow, um, to, to, feed, to basically grow co corn and soy. Wow. And that's just for the feed. Think about it. The cows also need to be hydrated. And yeah. then we're talking about massive factories of animals where, mm -hmm. as I said, in addition to poop, you've got blood mm -hmm. and guts and mm -hmm. all the mess that comes along with mm -hmm. taking something that's a living being and turning that into meat or a piece of food. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you need water for all of that stuff. And mm -hmm. dairy is no better. Dairy is probably mm -hmm. worse. Um, dairy uses about 98% of dairy's water footprint comes from uh, its feed. And then of wow. course, dairy cows have to constantly produce milk. So, they, mm -hmm. It puts a huge strain on, uh, on the metabolism of the dairy cows, mm -hmm. so they need to mm -hmm. hydrate, and they mm -hmm. also need to keep the milking parlors clean. Mm -hmm. So anyway, to sum it all up, it takes 1,800 gallons to produce one pound of beef and wow. 2,000 gallons to produce one gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. And if you still want context, 2,000 gallons mm -hmm. of water, you mm -hmm. can uh, shower for an entire month. So wow. <laughs> one gallon of milk or showers for an entire month. Um, and like you know, it. most people don't realize they talk about, I said, turning off the faucet mm -hmm. or don't shop, you know, California faced the drought and they mm -hmm. were trying to help people cut down water consumption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Average household water consumption is about 60 to hundred gallons a day. That's it. Mm -hmm. But you mm -hmm. factor in a meat heavy diet, it becomes yeah. about 4,200 gallons of water. 
That's incredible. But if you eat plant-based, you mm -hmm. cut it down by 1,500 gallons automatically. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is simple because you're not mm -hmm. growing crops to feed animals to then mm -hmm. make them into food. So mm -hmm. you are basically cutting out the middleman. You're consuming the, the food directly. Undoubtedly, it requires less water. Now, of course, mm -hmm. all plant foods are not created equal, but they're yeah. generally much better than animal food. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, I'm, you, you come, you're, you're telling me these numbers that they found out and, and it, I'm just going like, this is mind boggling, like just that cutting out one burger a day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what can we do on this planet? It's like, it's so simple. And I'm going like, why is no one else talking about it? Why is it not all over the place that people are being educated about it? Or we're kind of what you're saying, we're being told to recycle, we're being told to turn off the water faucet, or you know, I'm from Germany, and Germany is a very environmentally conscious country. It's like this year you're trained as a little kid to, to recycle and do all these things and turn off your shower and turn off the lights. But no one is really talking about plant-based food as the biggest contributor in destruction of our environment. Yeah. And it's just mind-boggling for me when I hear the numbers you're sharing with us. Yeah, and water is one part of it. And you know, think about grain. And if you if you mm -hmm. start if you basically were to get people to eat predominantly plant-based foods, yeah. we would be able to shift some of that grain production, which is now getting wasted mm -hmm. on farm mm -hmm. animals, and redirect it and redirect that land to be used mm -hmm. to create crops for human beings. Yeah. And by some estimates, you'd be able to feed four billion people. So that's, that's you know yeah. we already have solved the hunger crisis if you can manage to do that. Mm -hmm. Now it's easier said than done because mm -hmm. we just have the system that we're stuck with, right? Yeah, and the yeah. problem is that mm -hmm. we haven't accidentally arrived at the system. We've arrived at the system because people like meat, people mm -hmm. like cheese and milk, mm -hmm. and they like mm -hmm. eggs, mm -hmm. and they want all of that cheap, and they want it everywhere, and they want yeah. it yeah. available in a burger, in their grocery mm -hmm. store, in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so we've evolved with such a system without realizing that our population was growing, but our mm -hmm. planet, we couldn't grow another planet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so now we're at a point where now that we know this, right, I'm not mm -hmm. blaming people for why we got here. We may yeah. have gotten here because we didn't know better, or mm -hmm. this may have seemed like the right way to feed the world. But now that we know this, my, I think mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to be able to tell people that yeah. it's time that we course correct, because mm -hmm. if you keep heading down this road, Mm -hmm. If you knew you were heading towards mm -hmm. a cliff yeah. and someone was driving the car, wouldn't you <laughs> warn them to yeah. maybe find another path <laughs> yeah. so yeah. that you don't yeah. ride off the cliff? Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that's the situation right now. And I, mm -hmm. it's, it can get very complicated because mm -hmm. you know, I can spew facts, but at the end of the mm -hmm. day, we're talking about food. And yeah. food is is something that is very near and dear to people's mm -hmm. hearts. They, mm -hmm. There's cultural attachment to it. There is uh, family and history. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and as I said earlier, we're just so disconnected from yeah. nature and mm -hmm. life in general mm -hmm. that sometimes food becomes this escape for most people. Yeah. And so when you tell them all these facts, all they hear is you're coming to take away the stuff that I love and mm -hmm. the stuff that makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. They don't hear these arguments. And it seems mm -hmm. like, listen, this food is my comfort food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stop it with all your vegan talk. So <laughs> uh, It's true. A lot of people get very defensive when you want to take away the meats. And it's such a good vegan food. I had the best vegan dinner last night. We went out for, for dinner and it was so amazing. So, I, yeah. Yeah, but it's important, you know, you've got to be able to message this differently to yeah. different people. The goal mm -hmm. with the book was was to basically communicate the facts in a mm -hmm. very fun and friendly manner, as fun mm -hmm. and friendly as you mm -hmm. can make such a serious yeah. topic. Yeah. Uh, and give people the reality of the situation, present mm -hmm. what will happen if you continue mm -hmm. eating this way, but mm -hmm. also give them the alternative that if you choose yeah. to eat more plant based, and I don't even tell people you have to go vegan. Yeah, just just eat more plant-based foods. Try mm -hmm. to eat mostly plants, at least 70, mm -hmm. 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. That's all. Now, if you want to go all the way, that's up to you. But start yeah. somewhere. You can make a choice, even one meal a day, once mm -hmm. a week, maybe mm -hmm. only when you go out, maybe yeah. only on the weekends, yeah. whatever way works for you. Mm -hmm. There's really no excuse for everyone mm -hmm. to be a part of this solution. It's mm -hmm. just that all most people here is either you're going to be a vegan or mm -hmm. you're going to be a horrible meat eater. And I think... <laughs> I think we, it's important for us to to help people understand that this isn't about creating, you know, food tribes and mm -hmm. and, and little pockets that are fighting each other. It's more mm -hmm. about what is the best way to feed an entire growing population, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. a rising population in Asia 
that is yeah. now as they become have access to as the middle class grows they want to acquire and do the same things that the mm -hmm. west has done mm -hmm. they want to buy luxury goods and they mm -hmm. want to go out and eat steaks and burgers and grill hot yeah. dogs yeah. and that's the sad thing they're mm -hmm. they're emulating what we've done in the west without realizing mm -hmm. they're going to repeat the same mistakes as us mm -hmm. except this time around the consequences are going to be felt across the planet not mm -hmm. just over here or not just in yeah. Yeah. some country that's far away from here Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I want to circle back to the topic of solutions in one moment. Mm -hmm. But there's one more question about some of the facts about, again, meat versus plant-based and that is again the greenhouse effect and the CO2 emission. Because we're being taught, hey, drive your car less, take the bus or carpool or ride your bicycle. But we don't realize how little the CO2 emissions from our cars are compared to the CO2 emissions of the animals. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Maybe give us some numbers so we get a better idea. Yeah. So if you look at factory farming or industrial animal agriculture contributes more greenhouse gases, as I said, than entire transportation. Some estimates mm -hmm. say it's 14.5%, which is way more than transportation, mm -hmm. which is around 13%. Other estimates mm -hmm. put factory farming as high as 51%. Um, wow. And it depends on how mm -hmm. you calculate uh, the emissions. Mm -hmm. But the emissions from factory farming are so big because everything mm -hmm. that's involved in the system from the respiration of the farm animals to their digestive mm -hmm. system, to mm -hmm. growing the feed that feeds them, to processing those products, and then transporting them across the country in neatly packaged Mm -hmm. um, packages that are mm -hmm. sold in grocery stores or in restaurants, it causes a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. That's mm -hmm. way more than any other industry right now on mm -hmm. the planet. Mm -hmm. If you're to single out one industry, it is factory farming or industrial yeah. agriculture. Yeah. And the thing is, that's the system that's feeding majority of people who eat mm -hmm. meat. As I said mm -hmm. earlier, 95 to 99% of all meat, dairy, and eggs in this country, at least, are consumed via the factory farming system. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, there may be some other better ways to sequester carbon or farm mm -hmm. animals that are less destructive. But the bottom line is you still need all the land. You still need all the water. And yeah. we still don't have all that extra land. We still don't have all mm -hmm. that extra water. And even mm -hmm. if we did, we wouldn't be able to feed everyone uh, mm -hmm. that way. So everyone still needs mm -hmm. to consume less. Mm -hmm. So and farm, farming animals in general mm -hmm. against other kinds of food production, it is a mm -hmm. no-brainer. Plant-based mm -hmm. always wins. You will eat plant-based, yeah. you will cut yeah. your carbon footprint in half. That's, and that's so incredible. That's a huge step. We've got to, we've, we are in a race against time. If you don't mm -hmm. slow down the pace of climate change, we are going to be, by 2050, in a terrible situation. By In another 50 years after that, it'll, ha it'll be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And do you want to be that generation that did nothing? Yeah. Uh, when yeah. your kids and grandkids are looking back mm -hmm. and thinking about well, what were my parents and grandparents doing mm -hmm. when we knew these facts, when a book like Eat for the Planet was out there. Yeah, and you didn't read it and you didn't say, oh, I'm going to eat plant-based because it's, I now know the facts. Yeah, I mean, it's just, oh, you didn't spread yeah. that message. You would think that people would be shouting this from every mountaintop, every skyscraper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the way I feel about the issue. I just feel mm -hmm. it's my responsibility to tell as many people as I know uh, mm -hmm. in a, in a, and of course, because my the work I do is in media and communications, mm -hmm. I don't go around yelling at people because I don't think that's <laughs> effective. Uh, I think it's important to, to be smart about how you communicate this. And I took years to come up with this book because we wanted to make sure that it was solid on the research so no mm -hmm. one could find any holes in it. But mm -hmm. most importantly, it was presented in a way that someone who's a kid in high school or even college or no mm -hmm. matter where they are uh, in terms of their interest in books or the subject mm -hmm. of sustainability, mm -hmm. they would be able to pick up this book and quickly learn something that would open their eyes to this much bigger problem that we all need to start mm -hmm. tackling. Yeah. So I just think we need to spread the message. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying electric cars and hybrid cars and turning off your faucet aren't good things to do. Yeah. I'm just mm -hmm. saying do all that, but mm -hmm. this is so much simpler. And the mm -hmm. best part is the solutions are much better than they used to be. Uh, and the food is amazing too. So, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's pretty simple.
Yeah, for me, whatever you're saying, I'm like, this is so brilliant. It is such an education process that needs to happen. And I know you're educating the people with your book, with your podcast, with, with your website. So for the rebel hearts who are listening right now and saying, hey, I'm so inspired. I'm going to order 100 books and give them to all my friends, which I hope you will do, rebel hearts. You know, what are some of the other things we can do? Because I'm just going to sidetrack you a little bit. Yeah. I look at the school system. I look what's being fed in schools. I remember was what was available in my cafeteria when I went to school. And it feels like it needs to start over there. There needs to be a different education system actually already happening in school. Why are we not teaching children about the environment? Why are we not teaching about the environmental impact? Why are we not teaching children about permaculture? Mm -hmm. And so they have the connection with the plant, with the land and with the food again. These are just questions I'm going to just throw at you. This is what's happening. Why and why not? And what can we do to get it on a bigger, much larger scale? I mean, first and foremost, the simplest answer to that question is, what are they serving in, in schools and hospitals and mm -hmm. most institutions? It's yeah. meat. So exactly, yeah. it, is, it is one of the toughest things to tackle is uh, how do you educate people about food mm -hmm. and the environment mm -hmm. while mm -hmm or food and health while yeah, still yeah. serving them mm -hmm. the food that mm -hmm. we are saying is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So we are just trying to undo an existing system mm -hmm. that is so entrenched in, in, in the way of life in the West, especially that yeah. it's going to take years to undo, but mm -hmm. you have to start planting seeds. Mm -hmm. If you really look at the largest scheme of history, forget just the recent past, you go back a few hundred years, Mm -hmm. Factory farming wasn't around 200 years ago, even 100 mm -hmm. years ago, this idea of farming animals in the way that we're doing right now in this destructive way wasn't around because also we did not have so many people on the planet. So we, mm -hmm. we've kind mm -hmm. of back, sort of fell into the system because of a few historical events that happened. And I think it's important mm -hmm. for people to understand that because then it gets us out of the mentality of blaming people or corporations mm -hmm. for this. And yes, people and corporations at the end of the day make the decisions, yeah. but usually they make the decisions that consumers want. So mm -hmm. I think consumers still have the most amount of power. So in mm -hmm. the case of schools, parents have the most amount of power. And the problem is, and I've talked to people who are trying to introduce Meatless Monday in schools mm -hmm. and who are trying to change certain schools to have plant-based menus Mm -hmm. And are trying to change the the, the way we teach. The, uh, let's not get. I can get. I can talk about education <laughs> for an hour, but that'll be a complete tangent. Because, but I'll just make a quick yeah, point yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. Is that we don't learn the most important things we need to learn in school, mm -hmm. which is usually manifest in terms of problems much later in life. Mm -hmm. School and college mostly just prepare us for careers. And mm -hmm. as you know, and I know, yeah. and I think most mm -hmm. people will learn over years your career doesn't define your happiness. Mm -hmm. Your money doesn't make you feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a well-rounded human, how to deal with mm -hmm. other human beings, how to understand where your food comes from. One would think mm -hmm. that would be the first lesson they would teach kids yeah. in school is that everything is connected and understand that food is a part of a much mm -hmm. bigger ecological system that mm -hmm. includes us. We are not mm -hmm. separate from it, right? Yeah. So I don't mean to get too woo-woo, but the whole idea <laughs> is... <laughs> that we are not separate from nature. We may think we've mm -hmm. dominated nature. Mm -hmm. We may think we've figured out how to farm animals and de mm -hmm. destroy the forests and fish the oceans using technology. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the joke is going to be on us when we've mm -hmm. destroyed all the species, when we don't have any clean air, when our coastal cities are flooded, and when we have drought, and when we have famine, and we have floods, mm -hmm. and we have wars mm -hmm. as a result of this. So mm -hmm. it is the problem is short-term thinking. Yeah. And we've got to change that mindset. And in the case mm -hmm. of schools, I think it starts with parents. And yeah. in some schools where some of these programs have tried to change and introduce meatless options mm -hmm. and plant-based foods, the first people to, to oppose it have been parents. Because mm -hmm. again, there are, a lot of us have been culturally programmed to believe that we need to eat meat. We need meat yeah. for protein. We need uh, dairy for calcium. Mm -hmm. And especially growing kids need meat, dairy, and eggs. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they're going to have problems. So yeah. there's levels of health and nutrition education mm -hmm. that needs to happen, not just at the school level, even in the medical system. Most doctors Absolutely, don't learn about yeah. nutrition. Mm -hmm. And most hospitals will, will, will do heart surgery, and then you go to the cafeteria, and they're serving the same food that has caused someone to get <laughs> yeah. sick. So, here's, your, here's your beef. <laughs> here's here's your, your beef. But come back again soon. 
uh, and yeah. that's just, you know, it's, we're making a, we're, we're finding humor in it, but mm -hmm. the reality is yeah. it is, um, we can't solve all of it at once, right? So mm -hmm. I really say, and I think you believe in this too, is mm -hmm. each of us have to figure out what it is that we have in terms of skills, passion, mm -hmm. focus, mm -hmm. and decide what our path can be to carve a solution. So mm -hmm. if you are a parent, you already have power. Yeah. Right. If you are a parent whose kid is in school, you have power. You need to mm -hmm. say, you need to speak up and have a voice where you can do mm -hmm. it. You don't need to go mm -hmm. write a book. You don't need to go start a podcast. You can make a difference mm -hmm. right there. And imagine mm -hmm. if hundreds, thousands, millions yeah. of parents start yeah. to do that, the effect that happens. Oh, change mm -hmm. only happens because people want it. So yeah. the reason we are here is because people want a cheap, fast, mm -hmm. easy food. Mm -hmm. So the government gave us that, businesses gave us that, and a lot of people became really rich and powerful. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we demand we want cleaner, healthier food, we don't want crap in school cafeterias, we don't want to uh, serve foods in hospitals that are actually causing the disease that hospitals are trying to treat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, It's up to us to make that happen, which is why mm -hmm. information is powerful, and mm -hmm. which is why so much has happened in the last, I would say, five to ten years because of the rise of social media. Yeah, um, yeah. But the, the challenge with information is with too much information, mm -hmm. um, you then don't know what to believe because you can, mm -hmm. anyone can come out and claim <laughs> something and say, that's a fact mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Uh, and that maybe eating meat 24-7 uh, is what's going to save the environment. Yeah. And then it's up to an individual to do the research mm -hmm. and figure that out. So mm -hmm. back to your question, I know it was about school, but I'm just trying to say, the way I look at things is everything is connected. It's Absolutely. easy to look at just what's on your plate in isolation or someone's food choices in mm -hmm. isolation. But I like to look at the overall situation. You can't mm -hmm. judge anyone or you can't judge any system without realizing why that person became that way mm -hmm. or that system became that way. And yeah. then try to, try to slowly make inroads into mm -hmm. the things that led them down the wrong path so mm -hmm. we can course correct. And, yeah. and, and you mentioned what's happening in the plant-based food space. One quick example on that, yeah. Why do you think plant-based milks now are about 10% of liquid milk sales? So mm -hmm. look at the plant, look at the dairy aisle now, majority of mm -hmm. the products that are selling the most are plant-based mm -hmm. milks. Uh, that's because people love it, not for any yeah. other reason. Yeah. They learned that it's better for you, it tastes better, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they're demanding more of it. So that's how change happens. And I think we got to keep spreading the word so most pe more people Absolutely. at least wake up to this and they walk mm -hmm. to the neighborhood grocery store, then restaurant, and they make a better choice. And it mm -hmm. all starts with mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. And I love, love, love that you said, you people have the power because that is exactly the rebel heart message mm -hmm. that we've been wanting to share in, in throughout our shows. That it's, it all starts with that. We are the ones we've been waiting for and we need to acknowledge that in order to create the biggest changes that are possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you for, for you know putting our focus on that. Yeah. I'm looking at the time over here and we have a couple more minutes before we close. So I have two more questions for you. Sure. Question number one, what is the most inspiring thing for you in doing the work that you have been doing for the past years? Uh, I would say it is, I, I, don't know, no, I don't know how to live without doing it. So I, it's a, a tricky question to answer. Uh -huh. For me, <laughs> it is, I just keep thinking of myself a few mm -hmm. years ago, before mm -hmm. I, I became uh, the change that I wanted to mm -hmm. see in the world. I thought of <laughs> myself as, I'm just mm -hmm. another consumer. I'm just mm -hmm. a slave to the system. Yeah. And I'm just, uh, I don't have power. I just have to find a way mm -hmm. to fit within the system, mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. a living, yeah. buy an apartment, and live a happy life, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Until you realize that you do have the power. And mm -hmm. that's what woke me out of this mentality that I am mm -hmm. just a victim of the system. But instead, mm -hmm. I probably have the most power in the system. Mm -hmm. So the reason I bring that up is what wakes me up every day to do what I want to do is because mm -hmm. I hope that every day in the work that we do through our online platform, One Green Planet, through the mm -hmm. podcast, through the books, and through many more projects mm -hmm. that are going to be coming up in the next few months and years, I can make that make even one person wake up to that idea that they are not mm -hmm. a, a slave to the system. And that mm -hmm. they have the power to change things and that yeah. they don't have to do the same thing that you or I are doing. They can find mm -hmm. their own path. Mm -hmm. That is what excites me because I think um, just to be able to take that like a, like a positive, I don't, I don't want to use the word virus, but uh, if, you can use, <laughs> if you can spread positive. positivity. 
<laughs> meme, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, if you can spread that positivity and that passion mm -hmm. and other people and mm -hmm. get them to then take control of their own lives mm -hmm. first yeah. and then empower mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. we, that's the only way we can change things. That's the only way change happens. Thank you. That is beautiful. <laughs> Which brings me to my last question, Neil. Do you, actually, it's just, do you have one last, I don't know, message, inspiration for our Rebel Hearts audience before we wrap up over here? I would say this is, as I think the theme of today's episode mm -hmm. has been in our conversation, is that you have the power, and I know that's the theme of your mm -hmm. podcast as well, mm -hmm. in the context of food, you can exercise that power in many ways, whether you mm -hmm. eat plant-based or not. Every time you mm -hmm. choose to eat, try to eat plant-based or predominantly plant-based. That's first mm -hmm. thing you can do. Secondly, yeah. when you go to your, try to encourage your local grocery store or restaurants to offer plant-based options. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a simple thing you can do. And lastly, and mm -hmm. it's the, I say lastly, because these things move the slowest, try to encourage your, gov your government representative to shift some of this government support that's happening to the destructive meat and dairy industry and try to support and encourage yeah. the growing plant-based industry because the future of food is going to be plant-based mm -hmm. and it's going to happen because yeah. of every single choice you make on our plate one bite mm -hmm. at a time love it <laughs> what a great note to finish thank you so 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 much for all the inspiration thank you for being who you are and for all the incredible work that you are doing in the world and you know i actually said it at ubn with a show called all about indigos and you're such an indigo warrior rebel because the indigos are the people are changing the systems so yeah. you're like definitely one of those indigo rebels so thank you for being that and doing what you're doing it was such an honor to speak with you Nil. it was such an honor to be part of this conversation and thanks for giving me this platform and for all the work that you're doing thank you so much and rebel hearts i hope you are inspired check out Nil's book check out his podcast check out the website there's a lot of amazing inspirational information just by going on the website but i also hope you're buying the 100 books and giving it to all of your friends and spread the world word about plant-based living and how important it is for ourselves for the planet and for our future generations thank you for joining us today we'll see you in a couple of weeks wednesdays at 3 p.m and remember to rebel on in the future talk radio will actually educate inspire and make you think the future is now topics and music that affect your life from universal broadcasting network Tune in at UBNRadio.com.